Welcome to Mission Evolution Radio Show with Gwilda Wiecka, bringing together today's leading experts to uncover ever-deepening spiritual truths and the latest scientific developments in support of the evolution of humankind. For more information on Mission Evolution Radio with Gwilda Wiecka, visit www.missionevolution.org. And now, here's the host of Mission Evolution, Miss Gwilda Wiecka. Have you ever wondered why we have emotions? Do you ever feel like your emotions are so intense they might crack you open? Mission Evolution Radio TV show is coming to you around the world on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net. With us this hour to explore emotions, feelings, and evolution of consciousness is Catherine Shainberg. Catherine is an internationally renowned transpersonal psychologist, lecturer, teacher, visionary, and award-winning author. Grounded in the Kabbalah of light, her work integrates timeless wisdom wisdom with modern medicine traditions to catalyze creative manifestation on all levels in all areas of life, personal and professional, communal and global. She created the School of Images based on her profound realization about the power of images to create, manifest and transform. Her website, theschoolofimages.org. Catherine, thanks for joining us once again on Mission Evolution. Thank you for having me again. (laughs) So we tend to use the word emotion to cover both emotions and feelings. Are they really the same? No. (laughs) No, no word. Not the same. (laughs) They're really not the same. I mean, it's the same energy. That is that the energy that you have that triggers the emotion is your life. Your life force is coming out when an an emotion is triggered, but a feeling is another level of that uh, manifestation, if you want. If you look at emotions, they constrict us, they hold us tight. If you're in fear, you hold in. If you're in anger, you push out. Um, And then there are all the secondary emotions that kind of hold us in stagnant places. These are reactions. Okay. Is, Is love an emotion? No, it's a feeling. Okay, how can you tell the difference between an emotion and a feeling? (laughs) Again, it's the same energy, but it's moving in a different way. So if you think of love, your whole body, your whole being is expanded. If you think of anger, your your being is constricted and moving according to a certain pathway. So it's very, very important for us to understand the difference, because if not, we can't deal with emotions. So um, emotions and feelings. So if it's constrictive, it's an emotion. And if it's expansive, it's a feeling. Exactly. Okay. It's very (laughs) simple, really. (laughs) I think I got that. (laughs) So and and, and, yes, and in, in the literature today, it's all mixed up. Yes, I've never heard this distinction before. So you're right. Right. Yeah, right. So how does our body react to emotions versus feelings? Well, let's say I say something damaging to you and you're not happy with it. You're going to want to hit me or you're going to react. (laughs) Now, you can take that that, uh, emotion and use it. That is that you can use the emotion, the triggering of the life force into another level of, of uh, expression. And that would be an expansive uh, movement. So we could say, for example, in anger, remember love. So that feeling of anger suddenly turns into an expansive place of love. But we've changed from being of the frequency of anger into being the more expansive frequency of love when we do that? Exactly. Okay. What about when you're in a situation where it's pretty hard to access that love? I'm not feeling the love here. <laughs> That's why you train. Okay. So it takes many, 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 uh, it even takes time to be able to understand how a reaction happens, how an emotion happens. It rises in our bodies. We have to learn the pathway to the emotion. So again, I'll take the anger as a simple one because everybody feels it. It rises up. The French say 
it's like mustard rising up in my nose. <laughs> <laughs> mustard rises in my nose is anger, right? And then I want to punch or I want to say something to propel the person away from me or to hit that person. So this you, you... is an energy. Once I have really um, mapped it out, I can decide that I want to use that energy in another way. So it's transmutation of energy? Yes, it is. It's you mentioned... the same energy, but transmuted into a different movement, if you want. Okay. You mentioned trigger. Would you please explain what triggers are and how are emotions triggered? Well, um, it's, it's, more, it's a little complex, but emotions are, we have to take a look at our own life and take a look at if we are more prone to anger or more prone to fear. These are the two primary emotions. Then we have another, which I would call not primary, but is more part of the secondary emotions, which is freeze, people freeze. Right? So if I take uh, anger or fear, um, I can very easily map the movement of that. I can look inside, close my eyes, and take a look at how the emotion moves. And then I can do an exercise, which is very simple. I take a look at how it moves, then I move, move the emotion out of my body, and I experience, or I try to experience, the exact opposite. So let's say I say to you, in anger, remember love. So I feel the anger. Let's say I've had a terrible anger last week with my husband. So I feel it in my body. I'm mapping it. Then I move it out to the left using my imaginal hand. And I ask for the exact opposite sensation. So basically, you're managing frequency by canceling out one by using its equal but opposite. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I'm using the same energy again, but I'm not using the same expression of the energy. Okay. Now, we need the emotions. They're very, very important because without emotions, you will never be able to transform. So this is a transformational process that's very simple and very quick. But here we're talking about primary emotions, but you have a lot of other emotions, which I call secondary emotions. Um, for example, uh, anxiety. People are incredibly anxious these days. So how do you then deal with anxiety? You can do it the same way, very simply looking in, where is the anxiety in my body? What color is it? How does it move? So in general, an anxiety is like, like a, a, a tiger in a cage, moves all over the place, but in a constricted area. I can sweep that out visually because the visual work is very powerful. And then I can feel the exact opposite sensation. If you think about it, what would it be for you? If you would look inside, what would it be for you? The opposite well, of anxiety. The opera of, of would be peace. Okay. So when you say peace, where is it in your body? What color is it? And you've called it peace now. The moment you do that, your inside will move in that direction. Okay. So the using imagery to uh, manifest and to control um, the energies that move through your body. So they express in a way that's creative rather than destructive? Exactly. Okay. Now you, you can choose, you can, definitely it's all creative. Um, whenever you have a feeling, it's, you're feeling it in your whole body. It's expanding in all directions. In the ancient times, it was called virtue. <laughs> we don't like the word virtue today, <laughs> but it was called virtue, right? So you see each of us, is like a pebble in the pond sending out ripples to spread outward, creating havoc or harmony. Would you explain that statement? Well, read it again. <laughs> I can't remember what I say. Each, <laughs> I feel your pain. Each of us <laughs> is the pebble in the pond sending out ripples to spread outward, creating havoc or harmony. That's true. 
we walk around being either angry people or peaceful people or anxious people or peaceful people, right? We are manifesting through our energy something towards the outside. People feel it immediately. They so, can actually see it if they are, um, you know, if they look on the inside, they will see, oh, I'm looking at my friend and she's got, she's got a lot of red around her. So some people that can see colors around a person can just to tell. Yeah, but most people can tell anyway. You know when somebody's angry, you know when somebody's frightened. Wilda? Oh, oh there are What's the mechanism that uh, drives this? In other words, people are feeling my emotion in a room. How is it getting to them? It's an, an energetic pattern. We are energetic beings. We forget that. We think that we are only physical beings and that people are not going to feel. But, the, but they are. We are an energetic being first and foremost. So the energy of the emotion is going to expand, be felt on the outside. Right? Got it. Well, Catherine, right. it's time for a, a short break. Right. Catherine and I will return very shortly. So don't you go away. This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org. What really happened when Adam and Eve ate the apple? With us this hour discussing feelings and emotions, Catherine Shaneberg, her website, theschoolofimages.org. So that's the question this segment, Catherine. Um, please explain how Eve ignited the movement that is life. a big question but um, think of it this way it's a perfect world everything moves in a perfect way there's no uh, challenge and uh, the rabbis say that uh, Eve didn't wait for the fruit to fall into her hands she was impatient so she wanted to take or she had a desire for the, ap the apple or the fruit whatever the fruit was and she had the desire to take it and to experience the power of taking it. Now, the moment you do that, you set off a whole series of events. And that's what happened with Eve. Before that, there was no um, free will. So she's presented with a, 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 an impossibility. You are not allowed to touch that fruit. That sets off the impulse, the desire to have what I cannot have. And this is not a bad thing. That's where I say that uh, emotions are so necessary. So her emotion, uh, her desire to get the fruit, to be connected to the fruit, and to rebel against a, a uh, uh, being forbidden to do this, um, sets off the motion of movement and life movement in which we are creators of our own life. We choose how we're going to react and then how we're going to respond eventually. So is the act of um, rebelling against um, the status quo, it rocks boats for sure, uh, but it's creative? Is that what you're telling me? It is creative. Now it can be it can be very violent, but it is creative. If you tell me you cannot do this and you cannot do that and you cannot do that, so I'm going to be a good girl and I won't do it. But if at what, some point you say to me and you cannot do that, and I have a particular desire deep inside of me to do that, and I have a choice at that moment. So all this is based on what we call the life plan, which starts with our natural instincts. So there are a certain number of instincts that we have when we are born. We, are, we breathe, we move, the baby moves right away, the baby breathes right away, moves right away, wants food right away, wants comfort and pleasure right, right away, uh, wants to sleep after all of that. So all these are natural rhythms that we, that we have in our lives, if they're stopped in one way or another, 
we're going to react. Let's say I take you, you're eating a good meal and I take your plate away and say you're not allowed to have it. What do you feel? Frustration, probably. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> you're polite. <laughs> Most people <laughs> feel angry. <laughs> well, I could dump the plate over your head, but you know, you get the idea. You could. Yeah. <laughs> you could do. And that yeah. would be not bad at all because therefore you would express the that energy that was triggered and this is what's important we need to trigger we need to be triggered to and to enter into life to be a part of life to participate so she's triggered or you'd be triggered because i take the plate away if you dump the plate on my head you have expressed your anger and the energy's gone in that direction, and that's absolutely fine. Of course, it could trigger a wall also, but... Food but bite, at least. But let's say that you are thinking in a different way, and you see that I've taken your plate away, you feel anger, and you, you've been doing work on yourself. I can use that energy to create mission impossible or mission evolution, or, right? I can do whatever I want with that energy. So, so that's why I say that emotions really crack us open. They're very important, but we need to manage them. Without them, are we stagnant? I believe so. Yeah. That, so that that's kind of helps link in the creative piece that if we don't have that kind of movement, whether it's positive or negative, we're pretty much stuck in a rut. We are. And, and you know, it is, it is important for us to be able to have desire. If without desire, we're like a stagnant person. Right? We need a little oomph. And so that is, oomph, yes. Is desire a, a feeling or an emotion? It's not. It's uh, it's an, in, an an instinct, if you want. The instinct. Okay. So now we have three things going. We have feelings, emotions, and instinct. Right. So the instinct of the baby who crawls up the chest to get to to the mother's breast to feed right at the beginning, at birth, the infant does that. That's an instinct. It's also a desire. So you want people with strong desires. But they have, they can mis, they can misuse that. So is a desire an emotion, a feeling, or an instinct? It's an instinct. So desire is an instinct as well. Right, right. So my desire to eat my plate of food um, is is the instinct to eat. Now, if I come in and take out your, take away your plate, then I'm, you're going to react. That's going to be an emotion. Now, if you are an evolved human being, which I know you are, you're going to say, well, I can use that. And I can spread love into the world by uh, looking at this ridiculous behavior of Catherine Schoenberg. And uh, I can beam all over the world because I've transformed that reaction into a response. So... I'm going to give an example, see if we got it right yeah. here. Uh, yeah. A person, say a person is suffering from anxiety. Okay. Mm -hmm. And two people side by side, they both suffer from anxiety for whatever reason. The one on one side just kind of goes into a ball, looks for medication, whatever, to make the feelings go away. The one on the other side decides to take all that anxious energy and create a new project, put their exactly. passion into that project. That's what we're yeah. looking at. That's what we're looking at. Now, if you look around the world, a lot of people take the pill, take the medication, or put themselves in a hole and their lives fall apart, right? Um, or they think they feel a little better because they've taken medication. But in fact, they've missed the boat. And I'm not saying that in a, in a negative way, but we miss the boat if we can't use that energy in a way that is going to be advantageous to our life and to the life around us, right? It would appear that the, um, the movement of emotion that's <laughs> triggered <laughs> from yeah. de being deprived of an instinct, okay? Right. Some people are so overwhelmed 
that they 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 don't really have that choice right up front. So it sounds like maybe you have to be pretty processed in order to engage in this work. Well, as I've said, it's work. It's inner work. Right? First of all, we have to disentangle. And we have to disentangle how it all works. So I have them do little columns for a week. One column is instinct, second column is uh, emo emotions and secondary emotions, and the third column is what I like. So we begin to disentangle to see more clearly, because people don't see clearly. And that's why we're saying it's unfortunate that we mix emotions and feelings, because then we don't have that possibility of transforming the, the energy in a different direction. Do triggers sometimes come from past damage rather than clear and present, and we project them onto the present? Absolutely. So then how do we work with that? Well, let's say you have a pattern of always reacting in a certain way to certain situations. Let's go back, look inside. Where is it in the body? What color is it? And then what image appears? What memory appears? How old are you? Oh, I'm three years old. And who's in the room? Well, my mom is in the room. And what is she doing? She's turning her back to me. And what do you feel? I feel abandoned. I feel betrayed. Right? So we, we, we get to the, to the emotion. The emotion is, is a stagnant one. It's, it's no longer a forthright, I'm angry. It's become a, I'm sad and depressed because my mom doesn't love me. So we need to go back to that emotion, that stagnant emotion, secondary emotion, and start to dissolve it. Right? And there's a particular way that we do that. It's very fast that you can actually dissolve that emotion and clear it quickly. Are some people um, so imbalanced that, that, that this work is uh, pretty much impossible for them? No. No, but people, some people are more attuned to, let's say, receiving uh, uh, work from the, in the, from the intellectual or mental zone. Others really are dreamers. This work is for dreamers. Right. Now, you have many ways to, 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 to reach the same place of development. So you can be a Zen Buddhist or you can be a Tibetan Buddhist. So if you're a Zen Buddhist, it's all done with discipline and mental attentiveness, right? Okay. Well, Catherine, it's time for us to take another station break. <laughs> Catherine and I will be right back to continue our discussion. So you stay right there. This is Mission Evolution www.missionevolution.org. Is there a Garden of Eden to return to? This is, Mission, this is Mission Evolution, missionevolution.org. With us discussing the trap of emotional reactivity is Catherine Shaneberg. Her website, theschoolofimages.org. Catherine, I know that a lot of your work is, is based in the Kabbalah and the stories and the imagery found there. And one of that, I assume, is, is the story of Adam and Eve and the original garden. What does the original garden, what does that mean for us in everyday life? What, what is that exactly? It's really inside of us. <clears throat> I nearly interrupted you and jumped there. <laughs> you didn't react. How marvelous. Um, but yes, the Garden of Eden is inside of us. So we can return to it. The moment you return to feeling, you are creating the Garden of Eden on Earth. You are e expressing or ex expanding your your energy out, your energy field out with goodness, kindness, uh, uh, peace, serenity, creativity. All of this comes within the Garden of Eden. Right. So the the work is really to return to the Garden, having having discovered this for yourself, not being put into a garden and thinking, this is it, and I'll just enjoy it, and nothing is going to happen. So the Garden of Eden is an energetic expression? Yes. You said, you said that when we're talking about triggers, um, when you get triggered, you have to go 
inward and figure out what's causing the trigger and how can I transmute it? Does that work have to absolutely be going along with the going in and finding peace? I mean, can we go, we, do we need that work in order to go in and find peace? You, you absolutely need that work. At the beginning of the work is always, uh, think of it as, a, as an ocean. And on the top of the ocean, there's a lot of garbage. We need to clear the ocean of the garbage so that we can look deeper. And deeper is your soul and its structure and its beauty and its uh, uh, feelings. The soul is full of radiance and beauty. So to be able to do that, we need to do the work. And the work is, um, in, at least in my, in my uh, tradition, we look inside and the images, the, the subconscious is shown to us in images. In, in many, or, or in words, but people do sometimes hear words or they hear what they call the still small voice. We all have that, which is a very strange and interesting phenomenon that I can look inside and ask a question and pop and an answer comes. Or I can hear it. It's talking to me. Right? So we have this incredible um, ability to turn in, to look, to receive an answer. It's a dialogue. We actually live in a world of, of duality. So we have the outer person and we have the inner person. We can very easily turn in and find out what the inner person has to say to us. We could say that that's our, our soul part that, or our, our inner child that is talking to us and telling us, this is going to be good for you. Is there a, um, a correlation between um, identifying with your emotions and the inability to look inward? That's a possibility that people are so involved with their emotions, they so hold on to them, they're so angry at the mother, the father, or whoever, they want to be, they want to stay victims of their lives. This is a work towards freedom. This is a work towards becoming the master of your own self. You cannot do that if you're still um, feeling a victim of your past. You're not a victim of your past. You can learn not to be the victim of your past. So that's the work, the process that we go through before you start to transform. Every time you look and you do the work, you're, you're looking at images or that, that show you where it is blocked. And so the images, it's very easy to respond to the images. If I see... Uh, um, you know, uh, an ugly scene, a dirty table, I'm going to clean it in the outside world. It's the same in the inner world. People don't understand that. They, they have dreams. Dream is part of your subconscious talking to you, your inner child talking to you. And the dream is there to talk to you, to dialogue with you. So you look at the dream and the dream is showing you an unpleasant situation. Your work is to respond to go back into the dream and respond to the necessity of the dream. If it's a dirty table, I clean it. And as I clean it, something changes inside of me. And my, um, let's say my, my landscape changes. What is so powerful about this work is it's so fast. And also once you've seen the image, it's there. Once I've seen a, a, a dead tree resurrect and become a, a blooming tree full of a, a great canopy of green leaves and, and flowers and so forth, it's there. So I can go back to it. So you mentioned living in a state of containment. What is living in a state of containment? Where do I mention living in a state of containment? <laughs> in, in, one, in one of your lectures. Okay. What, is, what, what do you consider containment? Well, I'm not sure what the, the, the background of this is, but if I were to just extrapolate, um, I, I, I don't react. So then I'm contained in that sense, right? If 
if you say something to me and I don't like it, I'm reacting. <clears throat> now, if I can change it immediately, I'm not reacting anymore. I'm therefore in a, I contain my core. My core is strong and solid and, and uh, it's happened in a, it has happened to me that in a big workshop, I have somebody who says to me, this is ridiculous. <laughs> if I react, we've lost the whole workshop, right? right. But I'm, I generally find that quite amusing and entertaining and also worth engaging with. So this is what I mean by being contained, is that I'm holding myself and I'm not reacting. I'm responding to the world. So then does that containment give you that opportunity to go inward and say, where's this coming from? They have a right to feel what they feel. Why is it, why is it affecting me? Where does that come from? Is well, that, maybe is... it's not affecting me. Right. If I'm contained, it's not going to affect me. Okay, if I'm so not contain... contained, it will affect me. So containment means being processed enough that people can say whatever, and it's not going to, you're not going to take it personal? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I may take it personally, but I may uh, immediately transform it. So it's not going to disturb me. I'm contained in the sense in which I am the master of myself and my energies. This is the aim, ultimately, to be a peaceful human. Is the, it useful to take those emotions and um, like you were saying, track them back to where they were so that then in the future, it isn't a trigger for you. Oh, yeah. This is what we call the life plan. It sounds grandiose, but it's really all um, spiritual traditions talk about this in one way or another. How do I get from being <clears throat> an angry, reactive, fearful person to being somebody who is contains, who is not caught by whatever the other person is going to say to would. I can, somebody could say to me, you're not talking nicely. And I could say, well, let me look. I'm still contained. I am, I'm going to look inside and see if I agree with you. So, but I'm not caught like a hook. That person hasn't hooked my energy. Most of us get hooked, whether it's by another person or by ads or by, um, you know, the, the advertisements that say you've got to get a big, big house, you've got to get a lot of money, you've got to get this or that, right? And you think you do, you're being hooked by the outside instead of really looking inside and knowing what the truth is. So, oh, for sorry. example, you could say to somebody, um, oh, don't you want to do to win $10 million? Here, write a check and visualize it. And But I have to look inside and see if the dreaming wants me to have a, a check for uh, $10 million. Because what do you mean? only the inside knows the truth. What do you mean the dreaming? What I mean by the dreaming is that if I look inside, either it's in images or in language or in body movement, the body tells me the truth. So if I look inside when you say to me, do you want a, uh, $10 million and the inside shows me a tent? Well, clearly I'm not meant to have $10 million and it's not part of my, uh, my inner destiny, I should say. My dream, my dream destiny because my perfect alignment is what we call um, a great dream. So if you think of the Bible, you have a, a, a hero called Joseph who has a great dream. And then he goes through all sorts of very difficult processes in his life until he accomplishes the great dream. So that's what we need to do. We need to look inside at our great dream and then we need to work towards accomplishing it. Not well, everybody has a great dream, but we can trigger the awareness of it. Well, it's time for that station break, but I would really like to talk more about the great dream on the other side of, of, our, of our break here. Um, but please stay with us. Catherine and I will continue to explore the power of transmuting emotion.
This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org. What is the great dream? Where does it come from? This is Mission Evolution, missionevolution.org. We're continuing our discussion with Catherine Shaneberg. Her website, theschoolofimages.org. Catherine, there's the lead-in question. What is the great dream and where does it come from? You have many children who right away when they're tiny, they already know what they want to see, to want to do. They sit in front of TV and look at the stock exchange. <laughs> I had a little friend who looked at the stock exchange. He then became a banker. Um, you have people who actually know exactly what they're going to do. And then you have the other people who say, I don't know what I want to do. And they feel pain. This always tells me that they that they do know inside, but we have to move away all of the, the entanglements, difficulties, and garbage so that they can finally see what it is that they're meant to do in their lives. And it could be um, cultivating their garden, and that is exactly what they need to do, and that's their great dream. They become a great gardener, and they know each of the plants and how they work and so forth. So we have, it seems, a, an inner alignment. That is, I sit in this chair, nobody can spatially sit in this chair while I'm sitting in it. So there's something about my presence here sitting in this chair that has a particular uh, relationship to the world. You have a particular relationship to the world. Every single human being has a particular relationship to the world. And in the old uh, tradition, of uh, my lineage, it's said that um, we we need to we need to find that we need to find that alignment. When we find that alignment, then everything comes into into place. It's the the God alignment, if you want, right? So if you think of Joseph in the Bible, he has a great dream in which he is the. the standing in the middle and everybody bows around him. So at, as a young man, he is not at all equipped to be this very important person. As he grows old, going through all of the difficulties of his life and clearing them up, he becomes that very important person who runs the country of Egypt for the Pharaoh. So, so he's, he's seen the dream. It's inside of him. Why? So, is is the dream the same thing as a life purpose? I believe so. And it's something that we come with? Do we choose it before we come in? What's its origin? I think we are, we are, we are born wanting to be aligned. Now, this is mysterious and difficult to express, but there's an alignment or an order in the world. And each one of us has a particular order to fulfill um, so that the world is in peace and harmony and functions well. Um, this is what the old sages say, right? That each one of us has that little piece that is going to correct the world. Each one of us has that particular work to do. How, how this functions? Well, we can say that we come in with it. I do believe we do. We certainly have an ancestral lineage that brings us a lot. We also have possibly past lives that bring us a lot. And we are continuing the adventure. So, yes, I think we do have a, all of us a mission. And you hear it in people because they, they're so sad when they can't find the mission. Yeah, that purposeless wandering around is painful, isn't it? Yes. So um, can your purpose express differently throughout your lifetime? You mentioned the one that has this, this purpose when he's young, but he can't fulfill the dream until he has a substance in the processing. But it's going to express nonetheless in one way or another, isn't it? Yeah. Well, there are many ways that you can express one, one single thing. You, you can turn around the flower and look at it in many different perspectives. So, but I do believe that people are pursuing something. 
I had a student like that who kept on saying, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. But everywhere he went, and he had silly little jobs, <clears throat> but everywhere he went, he met somebody. And he did little something, and that person was happier. And so by the time he died, um, he had finally admitted to himself that that's what he was come to do, to meet people and to do a little, little we call it a tikkun, a correction for them, help them. And poof, their lives had changed. So he was like a little angel who came around like that, but he didn't know it until they far in his life. We can look backwards in our lives then and start to recognize our purpose playing out. Yes. Interesting. Yeah. So it's, it's that time of the show, Catherine, when I get to ask you, what's your mission? I am doing my mission. <laughs> I am trying to teach people that they have a tool inside, that they have somebody they can talk to inside, and that the talk comes in images, not so much in words, because uh, we have a left brain that talks to us and that can tell us all sorts of lies. But the images are the, the language of the body, and the body never lies. So we can talk to the images. Are the images metaphorical oft times? We, do we need to interpret them? We, we, they are not symbolic. They are actual. So if I see a tree that it needs watering, it's actual. I see the tree, I feel it, I, I experience it, I water it. It changes, it becomes flowering. Um, it's, it, you could then move out of the image and say, that's a metaphor for my life, for that's a beautiful tree, I'll go and buy one. Or you can play with it any way you want. You still experience the tree. So you say that emotions exist to crack us open. Would you please explain that? Well, again, if I don't make you angry, if God hadn't said, hadn't put a point of imperfection in the garden, they would never have left the garden. They would never have taken their own journey. They would never have beca become co-creators in the world. God created the world, but they are co-creators. If they are not kicked out of the garden, how will they express themselves? It's like a child that stays on, the, on his mother's sofa until he's 80 years old. <laughs> right? So they never express what they can express. So in the, um, in the Kabbalistic tradition, she, she does not commit a sin. She does what she was meant to do, which is to set the whole process going. And her name, Eve, is Chava in Hebrew, and that means the mother of all living. So she ignites the living. She start, we starts the process of, of becoming um, a co-creator, becoming somebody who is uh, taking, uh, has, has free will and takes decisions and changes the world. That, I find it interesting that uh, it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That sounds like polarization. Um, don't we need polarization to have an image in, in any case? We do. We do, we live in the dual world, so we do. But it's a conversation, you and I have a conversation and maybe in the middle of the conversation we want to change something. Right? So without that relationship, without the polarization, something new cannot occur. Now we can be locked into the polarization like people in war, they're locked in and they're, they won't let go, and, right? But maybe at some point something will break open and something can change, right? A third point appears, right? Something new appears. We've created something new. Do we have control over our purpose, over our dream? In other words, can we transmute it from time to time? Change the, time. the direction it goes? Absolutely. That's what we're supposed to do. It's called in Hebrew, tikkun, correction. That is, I look at the dream and there's a fire, uh, that's burning down the house and I find a hose and I go back into the dream and, and put out the fire and see what happens. The moment I do that, 
I might encounter this very angry person who's put the fire in the house and have a conversation and see what I could do, see how we can resolve this. So it's an incredible tool of transformation. Is there any, we're out, out of time altogether, but is there any yeah. particular agenda that we do it in one way or the other, or is that part of our freedom? We can no, have our purpose. Of your freedom. And, okay. So that's we can completely live. Positive. Yeah. You see the necessity and you respond to it the way you want. That's why it's, I call it a revolutionary way because uh, you're, you're in a way um, choosing something creative. You're doing something creative. So the work of the imagery is a very creative process. Well, we are just about out of time. What can you tell our listeners? What's one step that they can take to start living from their purpose? Remember your dreams. Write them down. Take a look at them. There's a whole process that I have called a dream opening. It's very simple. And um, when you, you look at the story, you look at the pattern, you look at the question, and then you respond to the necessity. Doing that is going to change your life. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. Catherine, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for the opportunity. Our guest this hour has been Catherine Shaneberg, an internationally renowned transpersonal psychologist, lecturer, teacher, visionary, and award-winning author. To find out more about Catherine, where you can find her books, workshops, and classes, and all she has to offer, visit her website, theschoolofimages.org. This has been Mission Evolution with Gwilda Wiecka. For more information to or to enjoy past archived episodes, visit our website, missionevolution.org. But please be sure to join us right here next time as this mission continues, bringing information, resources, and support to an evolving world.